Hello everyone, welcome to the final month of 12 and 23. It's been a marathon journey. We started off in January, just sort of making it up as we went along. Uh, but from February onwards, we had loads of different interesting themes. Um, it's been a really interesting adventure through the world of programming. I want to start off by saying a huge thank you to Eric. Uh, Eric's down here today on my uh, on my world. Um, a huge thank you for Eric, to Eric for all the work he's put into into 12 and 23. Uh, these videos, I know he's put tons of work into making sure we've got exercises uh, for all of the months. Thank you to everyone as well that's helped him with that. There's been a little team of people who have been going through um, month by month, uh, making sure we've got the right exercises. It's definitely been a big team effort, but uh, yeah, Eric, you've put a ton of work in. So I know everyone's really grateful for your work on this, but yeah, thank you from me as well. Um, I'm still uh, in Japan and had a bit of an Airbnb disaster. So I'm now in a tiny little Japanese hotel room. For any of you that have ever been to Japan, you'll know how small the rooms here are. So I'm slightly in a in a shoebox. So I apologize for, again, the slightly weird background. You can instead uh, enjoy Eric's normal selection of interesting programming books that he has. Um, so December is a bit of a catch-all month. Um, we planned out the month with all of these different themes and then everything that didn't fit into a theme ended up going into December. So here we are. It's a bit of a random month and we have uh, five languages this month. We have Cold Fusion, Groovy, Lua, VimScript and Ren. Um, so they don't have a, a lot in common. This video is not going to be sort of looking at five similar languages and looking at how they're separate. It's going to be five very different languages. Um, but hopefully that means there's something for everyone, whatever your interests are. Hopefully there's a language out of one of those five that, that piques your interest a little bit. I know from my perspective, uh, we've used Ren Axism um, and really liked it and thought it's great. I'm also a Vim user, so I've done a bit of Vim script and things in the past. And I've also played around with, with Lua as well from some gaming stuff in, in, in the olden days. Um, but I've never tried Cold Fusion or Groovy. I know nothing about either of them, so I'm looking forward to learning something from you, Eric, in this video as well. Um, this is the final month to get the uh, completed everything 12 and 23 um, badge. And for that badge, you need to complete five different exercises this month. The first of those is all your base, uh, where you take a number and uh, convert it to uh, from one sequence of digits to another base. Um, then there's flatten array where you take a nested collection and return a single non-nested version. Then we have queen attack where you have to determine whether two queens on a chessboard can attack each other or not. Then we have DND character where you generate random um, Dungeons and Dragons characters. And finally, we have run length encoding where you implement run length encoding and decoding. So those are the five exercises for the 12 and 23 completion badge. Um, we just, have we, have we deployed that, Eric? I think we just deployed that a few minutes before we started we did, this. We so we should be able to uh, to get that from now. But there's also the normal just um, Divember, December diversions badge, um, which uh, we just put together and just launched as well. So um, for that, any five exercises in any of these languages count towards that. Good, I think that's all the information. Um, so I think we should just dig straight into uh, into this. So Eric, do you wanna start off by giving us an introduction to the languages uh, and starting off with Cold Fusion? Right, so Cold Fusion was created in 1995 by Alea Corporation, who were then bought by Macromedia in 2001, who were then bought by Adobe in 2005. So it's now an Adobe product. It was designed as a, Rapid web development platform. It's a bit of, it was um, released at the height of the, the internet uh, bubble, uh, et cetera. But uh, rapid web development was uh, was really a thing there. And Cold Fusion tried to, to fill that, that gap where people just wanted to build web apps without having all the required knowledge. Then um, Cold Fusion runs on the J JVM. So uh, it's a JVM language. And there are actually two different syntaxes uh, in Cold Fusion, which look different, but they are semantically identical. So you can write in either style, but in the end, what gets executed is the same, if you, of course, use the same uh, logic. So there's an older tag-based markup syntax, which 
extends HTML. So it is HTML like, but it adds more stuff to it. So um, that was the initial version. But later on, they uh, added a syntax that's ECMAScript like, so what you write with the JavaScript, and that's more code like. And you can use the, the ECMAScript syntax in the tag base syntax, so you can combine them. But usually what people tended to do was to have the ECMAScript like syntax in a separate file, just like you would with HTML and JavaScript. Um, of course, the goal for this newer version, this new syntax was to separate uh, business logic from markup. But um, but you have, you're free, free, free to use the older tag base format if you like that better. Uh, and just know that you can also use the script based format. Um, Cold Fusion Script, which is the second format, is a general purpose language running on the JVM. Uh, and it's also how we use it at Axism. We use it as the, the, the scripting version. Um, in practice, uh, you, while you could use it for general purpose scripts, it's usually only ever used on the, uh, on, for websites. So um, while you could do more stuff with it, it's, it's basically just used for websites. Um, Cold Fusion is a paid product. So that's, uh, so how do we actually run it? Well, there's the Lucy Foundation. It's a Swiss based nonprofit who have a open source uh, Cold Fusion uh, server fork, and that's called Lucy Server, and that's actually what we run. So we don't pay for the Adobe products because that would be far too expensive for us, but we run a, an open source version of Cold Fusion. So you can run that if you don't have any Adobe licenses. Um, it has been around for quite a while, but it's still actively being developed by Adobe. And it's uh, commonly found uh, in enterprise software. So uh, customers include like uh, Apple, Adobe, General Motors, and many more. So it was very, very popular in enterprise applications. Interesting. It's interesting to see another language, a bit like we had WebAssembly last month, where you have these uh, two different ways of writing something that ends up uh, compiling to the same thing. Um, cool. Tell us a little bit about Groovy, Eric. So Groovy was developed by James Strahan uh, starting in 2003. And the project was adopted by the Apache Foundation in 2015, and then has remained there since. The goal of Groovy was to uh, develop a dynamically typed language on the JVM. Um, back at the time, the main language on the JVM was, of course, Java, which is statically typed. But um, many people found that the JVM was fantastic, but they wanted a bit more dynamism. So they wanted a dynamically typed language. And that was why Groovy was developed. Um, it was also developed because they thought that having a dynamic language could maybe also reduce some of the, the boilerplate uh, code of, of Java, which was fairly boilerplate -y at the time. It has reduced afterwards. But at the time, the, there was a common, um, re, uh, common concern that Java was becoming uh, quite verbose. And that didn't uh, go well with people that were used to dynamic languages. Um, while most Java code is actually also valid Groovy code, there are many differences. They're not the same languages. There are many differences. Of course, Groovy is dynamically typed versus Java being statically typed. That's a major difference. But also Groovy allows for uh, quite advanced meta programming, which is not usually something that you can or uh, could do in Java. So um, the language itself was of course, it, it, it's inspired by Java, but it was also influenced a lot by Ruby and Python. You see that in, in several places. The common uses for Groovy are for, well, scripting. It's a scripting language, um, which is a, was, was in contrast with Java, where you had you, you could also use Java as a, sort of a scripting language, but you have this compile step. It would be slightly more cumbersome, and, and Groovy fit in uh, with the, the scripting model uh, better, I, I think. Then there are build tools that use Groovy, for example, Gradle. Um, we use Gradle in, I think, both the Java and the Kotlin track, and probably also the Groovy track. <laughs> um, we use Groovy is used in CI, so Jenkins. It's a somewhat older CI platform. I, few people use it, but it's it was used there. Uh, web apps, Grails, so Grails is a framework. Um, a testing framework, Spock, which was quite popular. And um, many of the Atlassian tools support a third-party add-on that allow um, functionality to be added via Groovy scripting. 
Really interesting. Um, I learned a lot there. Thanks, Eric. Um, what about Lua? Tell us about Lua. Right. Uh, Lua was created in 1993, so just a couple of years before that, um, by Roberto Lerosa Limchi. Sorry if I butchered that. Uh, Luis Enrique de Figueiredo and Waldemar Celes at the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. My Portuguese is awful, sorry. Um, the name is pronounced Lua, which means moon in Portuguese. And it's actually a reference to another language called Sol, which uh, actually means sun in Portuguese. And Sol was an inspiration for Lua. So sun, moon, get it? Um, the primary um, design goal for Lua was to have a language that was great for embedding. So that means, what does embedding mean? What means that if you have a, a different program language, a different um, application, you can actually include Lua in your application. So, uh, and then you can run Lua code within your application. So it's not like it's the primary language, it's sort of like the secondary language, but it's completely contained in your language. And um, to be able to be great for embedding, there was a focus on speed, portability, extensibility, and ease of use in development. The language itself was inspired by Sol, of course, but it was also inspired by Modula, CLU, C++, Snowball, and Aug. And another great inspiration was uh, how Lisp uh, and Scheme in particular have a single ubiquitous data store, in that case, uh, the list. Uh, and Lua adapted that to, uh, to the language in that they also have a single ubiquitous data structure. And in this case, it's a table. So, um, that is something that they uh, that is quite uh, similar to Lisp-like languages. Lua is um, interpreted via bytecode, usually whilst running, but it can also be done afterward, beforehand. So you can pre-compile your code to bytecode, which makes it uh, faster to run. Uh, and it's primarily used for scripting purposes, which fits with the embedding uh, design goal. Um, examples where Lua is being used is World of Warcraft, uh, Dota 2, Crisis, so those are all games, but also applications like Adobe Lightroom, some free BSD system software, and also applications that have used Lua to allow for um, them to be extended, like uh, Redis, NeoVim, and Nginx. Interesting. Um, yeah, uh, the idea that everything has is based around a table is interesting. I'm sure you'll tell us more about that in a little bit. Um, what about VimScript? Um, VimScript um, is also called VimScript with a space or VimL, which is, stands for Vim language. is uh, It's the scripting language of, well, you guessed it, of Vim, the text editor. It was derived from X, which was a line-oriented visual editor that preceded VI. Um, and it's not a general purpose language. Most languages that we've seen here is uh, within the series were uh, general purpose languages, but VimScript isn't. It's uh, a very specialized one with just a single purpose to um, to extend and customize Vim. So that's that's quite different. Um, but in doing so, it can actually be uh, quite a nice language because it can uh, just cut away uh, everything that isn't important to Vim. So you have a very focused language, a very specialized language that does what it does very, very well. And you can extend... Um, Vim via plugins. Um, you can have configuration files in Vim script, macros, functions, you name it. Um, Vim itself is primarily written in C, but um, you don't have to know C to be able to extend Vim because they have Vim script. So Vim script you can see as it's an alternative to writing C. So um, C is low level ish. Uh, whereas Vim, Vim script is somewhat higher level and uh, more spe specific to Vim. So um, it should be easier to, to write these plugins, although you can do it in C. Yeah, well, where is it used? Well, you guessed it, in Vim. But there's also a thing called NeoVim, which has been uh, getting a lot of traction lately. And that's actually a fork of Vim uh, with the goal of being the best uh, IDE out there. And, uh, it's quite popular, but it also supports uh, Vim script. So uh, if you are a NeoVim user, this isn't just for Vim, it's also for NeoVim. If I remember rightly as well, NeoVim supports 
other scripting languages, and that's it one does. of the things that's different. I can't remember I think what. It's, it's Lua. <laughs> yeah, it is. I think it's Lua. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. You've got a choice. You want to do Vim scripting? You can choose between Lua or Vim script. Um, and then finally on to Rem, which is the most modern of our languages, I guess, and also created by someone that we both appreciate the work of. Eric. True. Uh, Rem was written in 2016 by Bob Nystrom, the author of the Crafting Interpreters book, which is somewhere uh, in the back. Um, its goals were to uh, have a language that is small, simple, and fast. And um, like Lua, it was designed to be embedded in other applications. And the author looked at existing languages like Lua and, and Tickle, uh, but the author found them slightly lacking. And he wanted to have a, a simple embeddable language that would feel natural to people with an object-oriented background. And that's not something that Lua and, and Tickle um, that are, are the strengths of those languages. So he felt like maybe building a new simple language that is uh, very object-oriented uh, like at least. So um, that would be easier if you come from such a background to, to start out with the language without having to learn, I don't know, different things the way, for example, those tables in Lua. Um, so where is this used? It's used in um, TIC80. Uh, if you Google it, you find it's like a, 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 a toy computer where you can make and share tiny games. Um, there's Dome, it's a cross-platform framework for making games. There's a Lux, which is a cross-platform rapid development gaming engine. So it's all game related. And then there's the REN console. That's actually a, a fork of the REN um, REPL. So um, it was built by long-term exorcism contributor, Josh Goebel. Um, and it has REPL support, so you can interactively run your code, but it's also a CLI. And um, we use it extensively in the REN, REN track because REN um, by itself didn't offer everything that we needed, like a package manager. I think Josh built that too uh, from scratch. So that was an amazing engineering effort by Josh. And I think he even wrote it in a, like a weekend or so. So Josh, if you're watching, kudos. Uh, you've you've done a fantastic job there. Yeah, shout out to Josh. He's uh, always incredibly good at just like locking himself in a room and just going and building something for 48 hours and then never thinking about it again. Josh is also the maintainer of Highlight.js for any of you who are into web development and have ever used a highlighting, um, highlighting platform. Um, cool, okay. So thinking about these a little bit from a programming perspective then, um, what are they like? How do they differ? And let's start again with Cold Fusion. So what they all share is that they're all dynamic languages. So Cold Fusion mm -hmm. is dynamic type. The other ones are two, um, but Cold Fusion is um, multi-paradigm. So you can do uh, imperative, uh, a bit of functional, but it's primarily an object-oriented language. So uh, whilst you can do the uh, the functional or the imperative way, you should probably be using an object-oriented approach to, to best uh, suit the language. Then Groovy is also dynamically typed, but it can be statically typed and it can also be partially statically typed, which is usually called gradually typed. So you, you have some bits of your code that are uh, have types, but other others don't. So you have this whole, uh, basically you can get whatever you want. If you can get full dynamic typing or you can get full static typing. So it's very flexible. Um, Groovy can be both interpreted and compiled. And that was from version two, the, the compiling uh, part. And it's often used in scripts because, well, you can interpret it. Uh, as opposed to something like what Java at the time, you had to compile it first, but um, being able to interpret it uh, makes it easier to, to run the script. Um, it's also a multi-paradigm language. Uh, like Cold Fusion, it's primarily object-oriented, but you can also work in an imperative, functional, or declarative way. Then there's a nice. loop. Oh, sorry. That's right. I was just interrupting. Yeah, yeah go on. Crack on with Lua. Yeah, so then there's Lua. Uh, which is also dynamically typed. Uh, and usually it's an interpreted language, but it can be, as I mentioned before, pre-compiled to bytecode. So that saves the, uh, the, the interpreters from having to convert the, the code to bytecode. Um, like the others, it's a multi-paradigm language. Um, it's procedural. Um, it's also object-oriented like, um, although it's quite different from what you might be used to. Um, it's somewhat functional and it's also data-driven. So it is quite interesting too. Nice. Vimscript? 
VimScript is well dynamically typed and it's also an interpreted language. Um, there is no compilation step. So when you run VimScript, it runs directly in your editor. Um, it's also multi-paradigm. I would say it's primarily imperative, but it's also quite functional. Um, so almost lispy like at, at times. Uh, and it has a very simple form of object-oriented programming, but it's not nothing like the full-featured object-oriented language that, that you might know. And finally, Ren? Again, dynamically typed, but statically defined. So it's not entirely dynamic under the hood. And uh, the primary reason for this is that it allows the compiler to be quite to, to deliver quite fast code because some assumptions can be made on uh, some guarantees on, on types, etc. So there can be less checks at runtime. Um, it's primarily an object-oriented language, uh, but you can also do imperative and a bit of functional programming. Nice. Um, so what is it that um, makes these languages good and interesting? Obviously, they, they're all language, well, not all, but they, a lot of them are languages that have quite specific use cases, I guess. Um, but why is it that makes them, makes them good, makes them great? Yeah, it's called Fusion has um, excellent separation between server management and application creation. So this was um, this is great for corporate environments where you could have uh, people managing the servers in a different room from the people creating the applications. It's very old school, mm -hmm. but uh, this was uh, very common back in the '90s. So um, Cold Fusion worked perfectly for that because um, the uh, application developers could focus on just on developing the applications whereas the service could be managed easily by server manager without having the two parties uh, having to uh, to discuss every single nitty gritty detail. This would, would be very simple to uh, to get them combined. Um, Cold Fusion also leveraged the power of the JVM and the Java ecosystem, which means it runs on a very stable, highly performant virtual machine, and you get access to all the Java libraries that you um, that are out there and you can use them within Cold Fusion. Groovy? Um, Groovy is a very general purpose language, so it can be used for almost any workload, including building apps or websites um, and scripts, of course. It also runs on a JVM, so once again, you get all of the benefits that you get from running on a, a, a big virtual machine, so performance, a massive number of libraries available. And Groovy was always intended to interrupt very well with Java, so the the, the interrupt scenario for uh, Groovy and Java is very, very good. Um, another great thing about Groovy is that it alleviates many of the issues people might have had, or uh, at least at the time uh, with Java, such as Java uh, has checked exceptions, Groovy doesn't. Um, there's no safety in Groovy. Um, it is less verbose and uh, it has advanced meta programming. And these are all things that Java uh, didn't offer or uh, maybe didn't offer at the time. Groovy is also a quite modern language, so you get advanced type inference, you get closures, you get built-in syntax for regular expressions, you can auto-generate getters and setters. So uh, it has a lot of uh, nifty things that make it feel like a very modern language. And then uh, the last great feature is that it has great functional programming support. Uh, so it has closures, which are like Ruby's blocks. Um, it has currying, so you can get partial application via that. Uh, Things can be lazily evaluated, so that's a, a great way of saving a bit of performance or working with um, infinite uh, data structures. Um, you can get immutability, and there's much more. So Groovy is also a great functional language. Nice. Um, I like the way you describe uh, the functional elements and reference Ruby. Um, I feel like Ruby's increasingly used functional stuff nowadays, which is definitely not how it started out. Um, Lua? So Lua is also a general purpose language, so you can use it for embedded systems, prototyping, scripting, uh, web development, backend development, games, you name it. So Lua can, Lua can be used for a tons of different purposes. Um, another great thing is that it's quite a simple language. It has relatively little syntax, which makes the language easier to learn. Uh, for example, it has just a couple of atomic data types and just one composite data type, which is the table. So you don't have to learn a gazillion different data types. Uh, that there's just a couple, and that makes it very easy to learn. Um, like many modern languages, memory is garbage 
garbage collected, so you don't have to worry about that too. So all in all, Lua is quite a simple language. Um, Lua is also a very portable language, so it me that means that it can run on a, a wide variety of platforms. And this is mostly due to the fact that the interpreter is written in NC NCC, and NCC, basically, you have a compiler for NCC on almost every platform you can think of. So you can run Lua virtually anywhere. Nice. Uh, Vimscript? Uh, Vimscript is quite a simple language, so it has a lightweight syntax that is easy to learn and use. And that, of course, makes sense because it is such a focused language. Um, it also has great interoperability with uh, this, its surroundings, so you can easily access files, uh, access the shell, other, run other programs, etc. So you get all the power of all the external tooling around Vim uh, without even leaving Vim. Vimscript is also quite an expressive language, so you can do a lot with very little code. Um, this is also a result of it being a very focused language. So um, they could just go all in on being the best language for Vim that they could think of. Um, so you can write quite compact scripts, but they are still uh, usually quite readable. And then the fourth reason is that um, Vimscript has a very powerful regular expression engine and uh, is actually inspired by Emacs Lisps, uh, so the big uh, competitor of uh, VI usually. Um, but with the regular expression engine that, that Vimscript has, um, it provides a very powerful tool to, to manipulate text. That's really interesting about the Emacs thing. I didn't, did not know that. Um, I would have sort of expected that one would refuse to be inspired by the other. It's good that there is some, uh, some, some love and friendship still happening in the world <laughs> of open source. Uh, finally, Ren. Um, so one of the great things about Ren is that it's very small. So the virtual machine is implemented in about 4,000 lines of code, which is not a lot. Um, it's also um, an exemplar implementation of a language. So the, if you look at that uh, virtual machine's implementation, the code is quite well uh, commented. So for example, if you look at where um, floating point number handling is defined, you get a huge comment that specifies what, uh, what the, the floating point implementation in REN looks like uh, and what things you have to keep in mind and uh, all the nitty gritty details are there basically. So um, if you ever um, want to write a language, um, you can actually look at REN and its virtual machine and also the standard library itself. It is written in REN. So you can quite you can also see how you would write like a standard library. And it's also uh, just an interesting way to see how, how do you build a language. Um, mm. You do have to know C because it was written in C, but if you know C, um, it could be very, very uh, interesting to uh, to read that source code and to uh, get an appreciation of both how complex and also at the same time, how, how relatively simple it can be to, to build a language. Um, then the, a third great point is that um, REN is, has quite familiar syntax. So if you have uh, familiarity with Java, C++, or any other object-oriented language, you'll feel right at home with REN. And that makes it uh, a great way to get started with the language because you get to use all the concepts that you already know. Um, one an interesting thing is that um, REN allows method overloading by arity. So that's the number of parameters. And that's something that you also see on, on Erlang platforms and Elixir, et cetera. Um, REN also has really good documentation. So the language itself and the standard library are all uh, well documented, which the documents are easy to read. They're quite extensive and they have a lot of examples. So that's always a, a great boon when you're trying to learn a language. And then uh, lastly, the standard library is, is small-ish, but it's actually quite complete. You don't miss that much, especially if you uh, use what Josh has written and because he added some some nice stuff there too. So um so yeah that's that's Ren. Cool. Um so then digging into these a bit more as we like to do from a programming perspective. Um what are their sort of particular standout features that you might not see in other programming languages or they do a particularly good job of uh, of implementing. And again starting with Cold Fusion. So for Cold Fusion, I think one of its standard features is that it's a, a batteries included language, all batteries included. So you get tons of things that are already built in that you, for other languages you might have to rely on, uh, I don't know, external packages, etc. So think of working with PDFs. Uh, 
zip files, Excel documents, XML, JSON, API creation, sending emails, um, uh, S3, Amazon S3 integration, many, many different databases. All of that is supported out of the box in Cold Fusion. So you get a lot of bells and whistles already there without you having to install anything but Cold Fusion itself. So um, that's always a, a great benefit, not having to scour the web for the that one package that you need. Um, Cold Fusion is also quite scalable and secure. And this goes with it being targeted uh, towards enterprise uh, customers. So enterprises value scalability, value security, and that's also why it is being used in these, these high profile big companies. And then the final standard feature is that it's quite a simple language. So um, it, it's, um, could almost call it intuitive. So the way that you declare your, um, uh, your UIs uh, very declaratively with an HTML-like syntax uh, meant that novices could actually quietly, quite quickly create uh, websites from scratch without having to be, uh, I don't know, programmers with 20 years of experience. Mm -hmm. And um, you might remember Dreamweaver. It is still around. I've, <laughs> I've used it before uh, when I was very, very young, but it's still there and people have been using it successfully to build um, Cold Fusion application because it has great integration with Cold Fusion. Fascinating. Yeah, Dreamweaver, something from uh, yeah my childhood. It's like 25 years yeah. ago since I think I last heard that. Um, okay, Groovy, what's uh, stand out from a very perspective about Groovy? Um, one of the standout features of Groovy is that it has very flexible syntax. So um, you can call methods without having the dots and the parentheses. And um, that sounds maybe a bit silly, but it actually has uh, a lot of benefits. And one of them is that you can create very natural looking uh, sentences. So it is perfect for creating domain specific languages where um, the code that you write almost reads like a sentence because in, well, in regular language we use, uh, we don't have dots and parentheses to, to make uh, function calls, et cetera. It's just, you have words and they're separated by spaces or maybe occasionally a, a comma or whatever. But if you see, look up some examples of uh, groovy domain specific languages, you'll notice how they they read very well, very natural, and they could even be read by people that are not uh, actually programmers themselves. So that's that's fantastic for for groovy. A second standard feature is that groovy has excellent meta programming support. You get both runtime and compile time meta programming. So for example, you can add an add to string annotation to uh, your class. And that will generate at compile time uh, a to string um, function method for you. But you can also change an object's meta class. We don't have to go into what that means. But basically, uh, what that allows you to do is to do monkey patching. So that's something very Ruby ish. So mm -hmm. uh, changing the behavior of uh, an object slash class at runtime. Then uh, another standard feature is that uh, Groovy has some excellent builders and is sort of. Um, related to the domain specific languages feature. And these builders are uh, a set of functions that you can use to well, build, for example, JSON, XML, HTML, all while writing valid Groovy code. So it's all uh, checked, um, but it still reads very well. And this is an, a very easy way to, to build those documents uh, without having to um, do string manipulation. You can also build, uh, you can use, uh, Swing to rapidly develop GUIs. So um, there's a lot of different builders in Groovy that, that leverage the flexibility of Groovy's syntax. And then finally, um, Groovy supports traits and traits let you compose behaviors and properties in, in reusable chunks. So what does that mean? Uh, and that it means that you don't have to inherit from a class, but you can sort of um, use a trait as a mix-in. So it is sort of injected into your class, but you can inject many different traits into your class. So it is a very um, interesting way of creating reusable code. Nice. Uh, how about Lua? What's interesting from a program perspective about Lua? Mm, I think the standard feature of Lua is how uh, embeddable it is. It was designed to be easy to embed and that has um, absolutely turned out very well for Lua. So it has a, a relatively simple C API to allow for easy embedding. 
And um, don't worry about the size of embedding an entire language. The full reference interpreter is 247 uh, kilobytes. So I think there are few applications that uh, could not uh, embed Lua because of that size. It's just incredible. Full interpreter, 247 kilobytes. Um, a second standard feature is that it's extendable. So the base language itself is purposefully uh, kept quite small. So it has um, relatively few features, but what it does allow you to do is to extend the language. So this makes the, the, the core language easier to learn, but if you need more, you can then use its um, extendability to, to add new features while still having uh, a very lean and lightweight language. And then uh, a third feature is that Lua is quite fast for a dynamic language. Um, oftentimes in, in benchmarks, um, Lua is one of the faster dynamic language. Sometimes it's the fastest. Um, and this is especially true when you run Lua with Lua JIT, which is an alternative uh, interpreter for Lua that is optimized for performance. Interesting. Um... 247k is just remarkable, isn't it? Like to think you can yeah. do so much with uh, with so little. It's, um, it's like it's like when a you think you install... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And you think about installing like other frameworks where it's like you're downloading gigabytes of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like you know, just thinking what you have to do when you install Xcode and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. <laughs> the contrast, now, I guess. Um, Vim script, which I imagine is also going to be really small. I don't know if you know how small that is, but um, I don't. I don't. Yeah. Uh... I don't know if you can actually sort of um, measure that because it's built into the the, the editor, sort of. Yeah, be hard. but uh, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe there's some somebody that can tell us. Um, the standard yeah. features of FilmScript that I would like to mention is that it's very extensible, and uh, with that I mean mm -hmm. the editor is very extensible. So you can use VimScript to basically customize anything uh, about your editor, and it will apply immediately. So you can get basically full control over your editor via code. And that's, that's something to, to really appreciate if you've been a, a long-time Vim user, how, how powerful this uh, customization can be. So customization is the second part. So the extensibility and the customizability go well together. So you can add new features, but you can also customize everything, uh, how everything works. So um, most Vim script plugins are usually written in Vim scripts unless there's a very good reason uh, for them to not to be written there. Maybe maybe it's performance, but usually you can just get by with VimScript. But this extensibility and customizability basically means that you get full control over your editor in code. Then there's um, uh, VimScript being event-driven, which means that you can write code that is only executed when certain events or conditions occur. Um, and these events could be like um, when a file is opened or a buffer is saved or whatever. And um, this is a very different model to, to many other uh, languages. Some languages have events, but VimScript has uh, has that at its core, where you you write code that responds to things that are happening in the IDE. And then finally, um, VimScript allows you to access all the power of Vim itself. So all Vim's features and APIs uh, are available to you, which means that you can manipulate text, you can manipulate buffers, windows. Whatever, uh, anything that Vim can do, you can do in Vim script. Nice, um, cool. And then finally, on to Ren. Um, Ren's standard feature is probably that is very fast. Like Lua, it is a, a dynamic language, but with great performance. So for a dynamic language, Lua of uh, Ren, Ren has uh, excellent performance, usually um, around Lua. Um, it's also a very embeddable language like Lua. So um, the language creator was a former game de developer and uh, Ren was partially uh, built because uh, the author wanted to have a language that was easy to embed in languages, uh, that embed in games, which is also why uh, the listing of the places where Ren was used had a lot of games. Um, it has a very uh, clean and simple C API. So it's also quite small. So basically it is, uh, an alternative to uh, to Lua uh, when comparing to it to being embeddable. So most of the things that, that hold for Lua also hold for Ren. Uh, what's different though uh, from Lua is that uh, Ren has 
a quite a good concurrency um, story in that it allows for easy concurrency via coroutines. Um, and these coroutines are called fibers in Ren, but they're a very lightweight construct. So they're not like threads. They're like um, Erlang processes or Go routines from Go. And um, you can easily create thousands of these without uh, the Ren runtime breaking a sweat. So for example, if you have a game, you could have a fiber for every single, um, I don't know, NPC on your, uh, on your, uh, in your, I don't know, your environment. Uh, these fibers can also communicate with each other. And in general, the whole concurrency um, features, the, the concurrency feature set of REN is, is quite extensive and works very well. Nice. I can tell you've been playing Baldur's Gate, Eric, when your examples start coming from uh, NPCs in games. Um, <laughs> I didn't even mention it with cool. the unique okay. character this month. <laughs> um, so finally then, uh, if someone's unsure which one of these to try in December, um, do you have any recommendations? How would you recommend they decide? Um, if you want to build web applications, I would probably go for Cold Fusion or Groovy. They're the most natural choices there. Um, if you are interested in embedding a language into another, another language uh, or an application, you can probably best look at Lua and Ren, uh, but you could also look at Groovy because it's also quite embeddable. Those same three languages, Lua, Ren, and Groovy, are also great options if you just want to write, well, general purpose scripts. Um, but if you're working with the JVM, you could probably best look at Cold Fusion and Groovy because they run on the JVM, so they would be natural choices. Um, if you value performance, I would suggest using either Lua or Ren because they, they are specifically designed to be quite performant. Then, of course, if you are... If your editor is Vim or NeoVim, go learn VimScript and then uh, unleash all your, your coding skills uh, and apply them to your editor. If you want to learn about how what it is to build a, a language with a compiler and a virtual machine, of, Ren is probably the best choice because of its, um, its small-ish code base, with, which is nicely documented. Um, if you have an object-oriented background, um, Ren is probably the easiest language to work with. Um, mm -hmm. But if you like uh, like your Lisp, where you have a single ubiquitous data structure that is that permeates the entire language and the entire use of the language, go try out Lua with its um, table. And then finally, if you have never tried event-driven programming, check out VimScript and see how what it is to write code that is automatically run when certain events occur. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. Um, thank you to everyone that's got to the end of this video. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this and all the other introductions throughout the year, and I hope you've enjoyed 12 and 23 in general. Um, we haven't decided what we're going to do in, in 2024 yet. If we're going to do something uh, similar, something different, we might take a couple of months off just to... Um, have a bit of a break ourselves and then come back to it a little later in 2024. Um, but we'll be sure to let you all know. If you've got any ideas, there was a forum post out about a month ago. Feel free to drop on there and um, post any ideas or, or any thoughts you've got. But thank you for taking part. If you've posted comments in these videos, thank you for those comments. They've been really encouraging. Thank you again to everyone that's contributed exercises or ideas or bug fixes or just reminded me to update the badges on the forum each month for all those things. Um, hugely appreciated. We, we literally couldn't have done 12 and 23 without you and again eric thank you finally for all of the hard work you've put into this um you've made this what it's been and you know tens of thousands of people are, are grateful for all of your hard work in that so thank you my pleasure i hope you all have a really enjoyable december if you're celebrating christmas or any of the other festivals and things that happen in december i hope you uh, get some time off and get to enjoy those and uh, i'll see you back in 2024 bye for now